We will have an Old Testament reading this morning from Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, and we will read the first five verses. And then following that, we will have our sermon text, which comes from Romans 1. Romans 1, we will read verses 18 through 32. Just to give you an idea of where we're going in terms of preaching, uh, two weeks ago I completed our journey through the book of Esther. And next week, my intention is to start a series through the Gospel of Mark. But in between, uh, I wanted to spend some time talking about this important passage of Scripture that gets a lot of attention in our day, and we want to talk about that. First, Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, and beginning with verse 1. Jonah 3, and verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of God, word of the Lord. Now, jo now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Now Romans chapter 1, and we will begin reading with verse 18. Romans 1, and we will read verse 18 through the end of the chapter. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fool, uh, fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, Haters of God, insolent, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew about God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Nowadays, many evangelical and reformed churches give a lot of attention to this closing section of Romans 1. Uh, this includes both sermons entirely devoted to this text and references within sermons on other texts looking to Romans 1 as having important information that the church and the world around us needs to consider. There are certain trends that have arisen 
in our society, particularly sexual trends, that have caused many to look to Romans 1 as a key text pointing to the danger of divine judgment on the United States of America. Because these things, that it is said, are practiced and tolerated across our country. But I would ask the question this morning of you, as you listen to the sermon, there are parts of this that I think that all of us, including myself, would agree with, and I'll say something about this in a moment. But what if, what if, much of this analysis of Romans 1 is incorrect. And what if the mistakes with regard to this analysis of Romans 1 actually mislead in a way that endanger the gospel message, the gospel mission of the church as it exists in our nation today? This morning's sermon will take a different approach to the text from what I regularly hear in churches and on the radio and hear Christians talk about. Uh, for one thing, after this opening section, I'm going to say very little about sexual matters. And because I'm not saying very much, somebody may ask, well, does the pastor not agree with the way those things are dealt with? And I want to say, actually, I very much agree. The sexual sins that are described here are sins. They are sinful. And as such sins, they deserve the, the, the judgment, the righteous judgment, the condemnation of death upon those that practice them. I'm not disagreeing with any of that at all. But I will say very little about that in the remainder of the sermon because you've heard sermons about that. You know all about that, and likely, just as I do, you agree with those sermons. I want to de uh, deal with other aspects of this text that tend to be neglected or ignored. And many people, I fear, including many ministers, ignore or neglect them because, frankly, they are difficult to understand if they take this passage to be about divine judgment on nations. One of the things that I su will suggest today is that the, the, uh, the uh, intent of Romans 1 is very different from what, the way that many people understand it. There are many things about this text that are neglected or ignored because it's difficult to put all these things together. And so let me, let me set all this up this way so that you can get an idea of where I'm headed with this. I've said, I've admitted to you that the sermon I'm going to preach is very different from what you hear in most places, including what you hear in places where the pastors are faithful expositors of the Word of God. Uh, preachers that we trust, preachers, preachers that we know are faithful, preachers of big churches, preachers that have widespread ministries, they will all deal with it in the way that I've described, and yet I'm going to say that much of this is wrong. So over here, we have thousands of big-name preachers, pastors of large churches, men that we trust. And over here, we have me. What do you have to say about that, Harry? I'd say it's a fair fight. <laughs> now, if you're still listening to me, you just heard me say that, and you think, well, he woke up a braggart this morning. How dare he? Thousands against me. Fair fight. And if you accused me of being a braggart, you would be right. I wasn't serious. I said that to make a point. And the point is this. If I actually were a braggart, if I were actually that boastful, thousands against me, no problem, then I would be guilty of violate, being in violation of the sins mentioned in Romans 1. Look at verse 30. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, skip those, haughty, boastful. If I had been serious, right here in front of you, from a pulpit, I was haughty and boastful. 
And somebody might say, well, okay, yeah, that, that's sin, but at least you're not a homosexual or a murderer. Okay, that's true. But just two verses later, after haughty and boastful, he then writes, those, uh, 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 though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die. We don't normally think of this passage in this way. We don't normally think that because he was haughty and boastful, well, we live in a nation full of haughty and boastful people. We live in a nation of braggarts. The nation deserves the judgment of God. That's not the way we tend to approach this text. We're very selective in the sins that we focus on. And many, I think, never even get to these sins in the latter part of the passage because they're really not sure what to do about them. They know what to do about widespread promiscuity and, and murder, which frequently causes ministers to talk about abortion and such things. We know about promiscuity, and we know about homosexuality, we know about murder. But why are these other things there? And yet I would suggest to you that an understanding of a text that has difficulty making sense out of over half of the verses might cause us to pause and wonder if we are thinking about the text in the right way. And so we want to look at Romans 1 in a way that makes sense, that helps us to understand the entirety of the text and what it means. And as I say, it's not just a challenge to question whether your pastor can out-argue all the others. But I think that the, right, that the wrong interpretation of this passage undermines our proclamation of the gospel. And the right understanding of this text is an aid to our proper understanding of the gospel. And so we want to, make, to, want to look at this passage in a way that makes sense of everything that's found in the text. And the first thing I would have you to notice with me is what I'm calling the catalog of sins. The catalog of sins. We need to ask, why does Paul list the sins as he does? And the common way of looking at this, as we've already said, is to see things that are happening in America and to bump them up against parts of this list and, and see that these are behaviors and ways of living that are not only conducted, but are tolerated, and so, therefore, God stands ready to judge us as a nation. But as I've said before, we never tend to get down to the latter part of the list and ask why some of these other things are mentioned as sources for divine judgment. And so the nature of the list, the wide variety of what's here, should cause us to question some of our initial reactions. If you take the entirety of the list seriously, you will see that this is not a list of the worst sort of stuff that people ever do. But rather, it is a list of the sort of stuff that you see in all human societies. This is not a summary of one society as opposed to another but it is a summary of the types of sins that you see in all types, types of places and occasions. And so Paul is not talking about the worst of the worst. Rather, he is talking about the kind of stuff that you see in any time and place. He's not talking about Roman society particularly. He is talking about fallen human nature generally. And in fact, the passage should not cause us to think of the roads of Rome or the streets of San Francisco. Actually, our passage should cause us to think about the Garden of Eden. Because everything that Paul says here is rooted in the original creation story. If you look back at verse 20, you'll notice that Paul makes reference to the creation of the world. And so if we're thinking about the implications of that, Paul is drawing our attention back to Genesis chapter 1. And so he starts there with creation in verse 20. And then in verse 23, he begins a description of idolatry by saying that man worshipped images. 
rather than the creator. The reference to images. What does that draw your attention to? Once again, back to Genesis 1, where God created man in his own image. And so we have references to Genesis 1 through 3. God is the creator. He made man in his own image. But instead of worshiping the creator, they worshiped the image, which is exactly the nature of the sin that Adam and Eve were guilty of in chapter 3. And so what we have here uh, is a fuller explanation then of idolatry that began in the garden. It was instigated by the ser serpent. And then we see this darkening of the human race that's described on to the end of chapter 1 that is actually a description of the course of the human race that occurs throughout the book of Genesis. Because this is not about an individual human society. It's about fallen human nature. This is people, not that everybody's guilty of all these sins, or that not that, that some sins are more identifiable in certain times and places than in others, but this is not about a culture. It's not about a society. It's about a, na a nation. It's about human nature. And it's about human nature from Genesis 3 all the way up till today. And so the descriptions of these sins are descriptions of the judgment of God due to humans because this is the course of humanity ever since the time of the fall. And so this is not a description of Rome or modern America, although we will see these things in our societies just like we see them in all societies. It is a description of human history since the time of the fall. By the way, thinking about the relation of Romans 1 to creation also can be seen in the way that the first five chapters of Romans are pulled together. In Romans 1, references to creation. God is the creator. Man worshiped the image instead of the creator. We are also brought, to Genesis, brought back to Genesis in Romans 5. The first Adam in him, there is disobedience and death. In the second Adam, there is, uh, there is the second Adam who brought to us righteousness and life. And so these first five, there's a remarkable literary subtlety here to what Paul did. He begins with creation in Romans 5 and the fall. He comes back to creation in, in, in Romans 5 and the accomplishment of Christ in our behalf. Death over here, right, uh, life over here, uh, disobedience over here, righteousness over here. There's a beautiful symmetry to all that is occur occurring in the first five chapters of the book of Romans. And so we've seen the catalog of sins. But second, I would have you to notice with me the consideration of sentencing. In verse 18... Once we, again, we read, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of men. In verse 32, we read, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, that they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so bookmarking our catalog of sins are these statements about the judgment of God against the sins that he's listed. This is the nature of the fallen human race. This is what humanity looks like. This is the history of the book of Genesis, and it's the history of the 21st century, it, and, and, and everything between. In all of that, we see a human race that merits the judgment of God. And so we look at these verses... If we think of them in terms of national sin, we get much that's wrong because actually what's described here is judgment against the entirety of the human race. Now, Romans 1 is continued by Romans 2. And when I started working on this sermon, I, I actually initially intended to make a list of all of the references to judgment in Romans 2. And after working on it for a little while, I threw my pen down and said, oh, all these verses in chapter 2. 
refer to judgment, either each single verse or each grouping of verses. It's all about the judgment of God. And then in Romans 3, the first half of it, you have a continuation of the same thing. Uh, and so the theme of judgment continues through the first few chapters up until the middle of chapter 3. And in fact, um, the, in the, while there are continuous uh, references to judgment, there are very different types of sin that are described in these subsequent chapters. And so in chapter 2, we have uh, what we might call the ethicist. The person who has this strong desire to do good, maybe he teaches ethics to others. But the person that has this strong, out of his conscience, has this strong desire to do good and teaches it to others, does he live up to what he knows? No. And so throughout chapter 2, we have a description that this ethicist is due the judgment of God. And then we go into chapter 3, and there's clarity that chapter 3 deals with the Jew who has the law, who knows it, who hears it. But is hearing the law the same thing as doing it? The answer to that question is no. Um, we, as we say every Sunday during church, we hear the law of God, but we have to confess our sins because we do not do the law of God. And so we, we fall short, as 23 says in chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But even before that, this, the, the section on human nature and judgment concludes in verses 19 through and 20. For we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so you have a consistency from the middle of chapter 1 to the middle of chapter 3. Human, the human race manifests itself in various ways. But all of the ways that the human race manifests itself are all uh, guilty before God and subject to the judgment of God. And so we have here the true meaning, the true significance of Romans 1, because it has to be read along with Romans 2 and Romans 3. This is a block of Scripture that has to all be read together. Again, it's not about any particular society, culture, or nation. This is about human nature. And human nature is subject to the wrath of God because we follow after our father Adam and therefore are guilty of the kinds of sin that we dis see discussed over these three chapters. And so Romans 1 is about human nature. Romans 2 is about human nature. Romans 3 is about human nature. We are fallen and deserving of death. In this regard, it's also interesting to note that Romans 1, you would expect that if we are sinful in this way and that we are subject to the, the, to the judgment of God, you would expect that there would be some commands in Romans 1, some imperatives, some things we should start doing. Read Romans 1 carefully from verse 18 forward. There are no commands in Romans 1. There are descriptions. There are no commands. Read Romans 2. There are descriptions. There are no commands. Read Romans 3. There are descriptions. There are no commands. Now beginning in the middle of chapter 3 and going through the end of chapter 5, Paul then takes up the subject of justification by faith alone, but still, there are descriptions, but there are no commands. The first command, Paul doesn't give any commands to lost people here. The first commands actually occur in Romans 6, when Paul is describing people that have been justified by faith and united with Christ in his death and resurrection, and it is at that point that Paul then says to people that used to be characterized by Romans 1, 
In Romans 6, you have been justified, you have been united with Christ. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Commands. And so he speaks word of command about how to live, how to behave to those who have been justified by faith and united to Christ. And so getting Romans 1 right, with all that it says about the wrath of God and being worthy of death, provides for us an, an environment for understanding the necessity of justification by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. So what's all this mean? We've seen the catalog of sins and the, uh, the continuation of sentencing. But finally, I want you to think with me about the commission of the saints. So what are we to do with this doctrinal background other than to say, boy, the pastor got wound up today. The doctrinal background that I have summarized this morning has numerous practical implications for us as Christians and as a church. There's a sense in which I buried the lead because the lead that I want to emphasize actually occurs prior to verse 18. Look back to verse 15 of Romans 1. So I am eager. 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 You get the idea I want to emphasize the word eager? <laughs> so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Starting with verse 18, he's going to give this horrible catalog of sins. What we see listed in Romans 1 is ugly. And then we go on through Romans 2 and 3. These are sins that deserve death. They merit the judgment of God. Eternal condemnation. Not just temporal condemnation, but as, as we read in our affirmations earlier, eternal condemnation against sin. And so Paul's going to give this whole catalog of sins, and I fear that nowadays the church is really good at that. We know what's wrong in the world around us. We don't like it. But what is often missing is that we approach sin and judgment like Jonah did. God calls us to go there. I don't like Nineveh. They're the enemies. And they don't live right. And we know what Jonah did at first. Nineveh was that way, and so he tried to get on a boat going this way. But even after Jonah learned his lesson the hard way, he went back to Nineveh and God said, preach the judgment, the, preach the message that I have for you. And do you get the sense that John, Jonah did absolutely the minimum necessary? It was a three days journey across Nineveh. Jonah walked for a day. <laughs> and Jonah's message was only judgment. He didn't offer any hope. They found hope in Nineveh, but they wouldn't have gotten it from the words of Jonah. Jonah pronounced judgment, he pronounced condemnation, he warned that they were wicked, and then he went and sat down in the shade to watch the fireworks. That was Jonah's attitude. Paul was different. He knew about this whole catalog of sins, and he knew the extent to which Many of these things characterized the city of Rome, which was an ugly place to be in the middle of the first century. He knew about all that. And yet Paul said, I am eager to preach the gospel in Rome. Now you might ask, well, what, what exactly does he mean when he says that he's preaching the gospel? And by the way, Paul was not just engaging in pious talk here. He'd gone to other hard places. He'd preached in Corinth, in Ephesus, in places where they picked up big rocks to stone him to death. And so Paul went to the hard places. He had not simply avoided Rome. 
And you said, yeah, in, in Rome too. I am eager to preach the gospel. <clears throat> now Paul defines the gospel in the first four verses of the letter in which he emphasizes that the gospel involves the resurrection of the Son of God. Now in other places, particularly in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's definition of the gospel emphasizes both the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And certainly later in Romans, he will have a lot to say about the death of Christ in our behalf. But the emphasis in the opening verses of Romans is on the resurrection of the Son of God. And, and the reason for that seems to be that he will define the gospel as involving the resurrection in the opening verses, and then he will describe the gospel as the power of God that leads to salvation in verse 16. But he wants to talk about the gospel, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ. He emphasizes resurrection power because the resurrection power of God is God's response to everything that starts in Romans 1.18 and goes forward for the next couple of chapters. It's resurrection power with which God confronts, with which the apostolic messenger confronts the sin of mankind. And so it's knowing God's power that brings about in Paul an eagerness, eagerness to preach the gospel even in Rome. He was not at all reluctant like Jonah. He was eager to preach the gospel because he knew about the power of God. So what does all of this mean for us? Uh, Paul was a, an apostle and a missionary. The word apostle doesn't describe any of us and I suspect that all of us, or at the very least most of us, are not prepared to sell our homes, pack our bags, and head to some desperately difficult place in order to preach the gospel. Uh, that's not the calling of everybody. It was the calling of Paul. But nonetheless, there is reason for eagerness with regard to all of us. We are missionaries here in the county in which we live, and the needs while we might not live in a place that's like some of the other dark places, humanity is fallen in Brazos County just like it is in the other great cities and counties of our nation and our world. And so there ought to be an eagerness that the gospel be proclaimed here in the county in which we live. But with regard to others in other places, while we may not go personally, we nevertheless should be eager eager to pray, eager to give, eager to send, because we know that however hard or easy a location seems, all can be seen in the light of gospel power. I am eager, Paul says. And just as our Paul was eager, while our callings may different, be different, we should be eager in prayer, in love, that the gospel go out to the easy places and even to the hard because the human race is fallen without Christ everywhere. And so I emphasized at the start of the message this morning that today's approach to the text differs from what we often hear. Maybe it differs from what many of us believe. But in closing, and, and I respect that by the way, I, I'm passionate about this, but I, I understand that folks come from other places. But I want to emphasize that I'm not alone in the way I've read the text this morning. You have the right to know that your pastor is neither a heretic or a nut. I may be, but today's sermon doesn't prove it. <laughs> a nut, not a heretic. But anyway, <clears throat> I do want to emphasize that in my preparation for this, I've consulted a lot of Reformed writers going back to and including John Calvin and many, many others. And so the way that I've read Romans 1 is, while it may be different from the way many preachers are approaching it today, it is well within the mainstream of our confessionally Reformed heritage. However, it seems that there are well-worn paths that now have weeds growing in them. What is at stake is the gospel itself. We've suggested a reading not only of Romans 1, 
but of the entire first several chapters of Romans that emphasizes Christian mission, the power of the Christian gospel in the midst of a fallen world. We've talked about the plight of not just a group of people, but of the entire human race and of the gospel as a solution to that plight. And so a proper reading, a right reading of Romans 1 sets us on course for the primacy of the gospel and the message of justification by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. If we hold such convictions in the face of opposition from the culture around us, we will not fear, but we will be eager to confront that opposition with the claims of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us out out of that mass of lost humanity. We pray that you would help us to look at the first three chapters of Romans and see much about our own backgrounds and where we could have been destined if not for the justifying grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that Christ died for our sins, that he rose for our justification. And we pray that we would live in belief in and on mission for him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.